I had to bend over and pick something up out there in the lobby. And I looked at Kevin. I said, I don't remember being, the floor being that far away before. He said, well, I just think you're getting taller. So, uh, it's an amazing song that we just sang. Who can hold back the Lord? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Um, Barbara Danner, come up here. Yeah, you did. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Find me a mic, would you? Tell them what you shared with me back there. Oh, okay. About the word of the Lord. Okay. Um, I told him that I appreciated in the nine o'clock, what's it called, gospel hour, um, how he spoke about the word of God. Like when Jesus spoke, the seas calmed. Smooth as glass, I'm sure. And how we don't understand and don't comprehend that at any time God has that control. A word from God, it's done. And there's nothing he's not unaware of and nothing that he can't handle. Um, there's a song, um, What a Beautiful Name. There's a line in there that says, he has no rival. The devil's not his rival. He's already beat. He has no equal. The devil is not equal to God. He's already been beat. And I just appreciate that so much. You're welcome. <laughs> she did. This is a... Uh, a sad morning for uh, us as a church. Um, some of you might not have been very familiar with her, but uh, we lost Jolene uh, this week. Um, she always sits right back there on the back row. Um, I was able to be there with her when she took that last breath. I was standing there watching her as she was, her breathing was getting slower and more time between breaths. And I also had that same privilege of being there with her husband, Randall, and I watched him take his last breath. These are two people that I said to Walton Lane, as we were walking out of the hospital, I said, apart from my mom and dad, they're right there. And they meant that much to me. They knew me before I knew them. That's how long I've known them, since I was a little boy. Randall had served with my dad in two different churches, um, served as a deacon, and then in Later years, Randall served here up till his passing, and he served on our leadership team as an elder in this church. And I know a lot of you may not know or wouldn't have known him and might not be familiar with Jolene, but they were extremely instrumental in allowing God to use them in order for us to be where we are today as a church and so today we I just want to make you aware of that and 
and just honor her uh, in her passing. I couldn't help as I stood beside the bed, you know, thinking of what Paul said, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And I had the great privilege of watching her leave us and enter into his presence. And I look forward to the day when I see her again. After my mom passed away, I began to call Jolene mom. And I always referred to her that way. Um, And I told her when mom passed away, I said, you know, I don't have a mom anymore. I'd like you to be that for me. And she was in so many, many ways. So her visitation will be this Tuesday evening here at the church uh, from 6 to 8. And uh, I would encourage you to come and show her family just how much we loved her and how much she meant to us. And then the funeral will also be here Wednesday morning at uh, 10 o'clock. So just wanted to let you know that. Something else that I want to speak to as well is yesterday was Veterans Day, and I want to take a moment to honor our veterans. Those of you that are present, if you are here as a veteran, would you please stand up? Thank you. Thank you very much. We forget often the sacrifice and the commitment that that is required of those who are willing to serve in our military forces and the sacrifices that many families suffer because of that. We have this tendency to take a lot of things for granted and we become very complacent and very comfortable and uh, shame on us for that. And we're seeing a deterioration of a remembering in our nation right now. And may God help us and have mercy on us. For the nation that we have been because of what he has made us to be and for what is happening in our, in our country today, many should be ashamed. So thank you as veterans, and we remember those that have also passed away and gone on uh, that have served our country as well. Uh, Maybe some of you are a spouse of of someone who was a veteran uh, that has passed away. We honor you as well. This morning, I'm going to speak of a message. It's called Restrained by Love. And it may be a strange title or sound a little strange, but I think as we go on and we work through it, I think you'll begin to understand what it's about. Uh, it's been a tough week, you know, one, because of the passing of, of Jolene, but um, also because of the tragic news that we all began to learn about Sunday afternoon after we returned home of the tragedy that took place in, in the church there in Texas. Um, I hope that your prayers have included the family members, the survivors of those members of that congregation uh, there in Texas this week as well as this morning. Um, Please pray for them. Uh, Pray for our nation, our country, our leaders. Uh, Many are standing up for the gospel, and are being persecuted for that, and uh, we need to hold them up in prayer. Uh, Some of you may also be receiving a little mockery and flack from co-workers that you work with and different ones, Um, that we stand together as brothers and sisters in Christ, and and though we've never met those people, uh, we will meet them when we all are joined together. Uh, in heaven, but they are our brothers and our sisters. Restrained by love, I'm going to ask you to pray with me this morning, 
that I can get out of the gate well. Father, as I stand here on this stage before your people, I just ask you to speak through me this morning. Help me to communicate, to articulate the word that you've given me. Now, Father, amidst the distractions that have taken place this week, Father, I pray that, that the words that I speak will be your words and that, Father, that they will, they will accomplish what you send them to do. I thank you for the reminder of the passages that we'll read today. And I ask this in your name. Amen. Isaiah chapter 53, pick it up in verse 2. My servant, who is Jesus, is who he's talking about here, grew up in the Lord's, which is the Father's presence, like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. If you know the Christmas story, you know that Jesus was born to a poor family, uh, that he was not recognized as royalty. Uh, There was nothing special about his life, about his family, uh, about where he was raised. It says he was despised and rejected. He was a man of sorrows. He was acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we didn't care. Yet it was our weaknesses that he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. We thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. You see, all of us like sheep have strayed away. We've left God's path to follow our own, and yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as sheep is silent before the shears, He did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong. He had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and to cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he'll be satisfied. Because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels, and he bore the sins of many, and he interceded for rebels." In Isaiah 52, verse 14, speaking about the suffering of the Messiah, of the Christ, in giving a description of what took place and what he looked like, it says this, many were amazed when they saw him, for his face was so disfigured that he seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know that he was a man. I don't know that you and I have ever seen someone beaten as badly as Jesus was beaten. To the point that, according to Scripture, he was unrecognizable. 
I've never seen anybody that's been beat that bad. And I've seen some ugly fights. For many years, I, I never really was impacted by the hurt and the pain that God, our Father, must have experienced through Jesus' final hours. You see, I, I never thought growing up, I grew up in the church, so I grew up as a child hearing the Easter stories, hearing about the beatings, hearing about the ugliness of what took place. I, I do a message from time to time at Easter and I go into detail in describing what that beating looked like. And it's one where I prefer all the children to be in children's church and to be out of here. Because it's horrific. I've heard my dad speak about it many times as a child growing up. I've read about it in the Bible as a child growing up. But still, I was never really impacted by the effect that the beatings had on God on his father. God gave me an opportunity not once but twice to get a glimpse, just a glimpse of what it may have felt like and what it felt or what it felt like for him on the day that Jesus was crucified. I received a phone call one morning from the golf course there in Lawson, which Travis worked at, and the supervisor there said, you need to come and get Travis to take the emergency room. Uh, he has injured his hand. And so I went and picked him up, took him to the emergency room, and I don't know if you've ever had a hand injury, you know, of a finger or whatever, but there's not a whole lot they can do to really help to deaden the pain and deal with the pain. And the, bus the room was busy, the emergency room was busy that morning, and they had put shots in his fingers, in his thumb, the best that they could. And then the doctor got distracted and got delayed and wasn't able to get back. And because they were so busy, by the time they got back to Travis, that it was the, what medication they had put in him really wasn't doing much good. And I remember standing in that room and watching him on that bed and listening to him as they were working on that thumb, trying to repair that thumb, and it was all I could do to stand there. And it was horrible. A few years later, Gavin was in a pool accident where he hit his face on the side of an in-ground pool, busted a tooth out, or part of it. It had been better if he had taken it all out, I think, but part of it, and I had to take him to a, a dental surgeon, whatever. And they went to work on him, and I'm in the lobby, and I can see through the doorway where they're working at him, and I guess because of the condition of the tooth and where it was and what was going on, again, there wasn't much they could do to control the pain and deaden the pain for him. And they went to work on him, and I remember get it, them getting up on him and over him to try to get, deal with this tooth, and I could hear him. I mean, just hollering out and them holding him down. And I'm telling you, I wanted to go in that room and clear that room out. I just couldn't understand why so much pain. Why couldn't they do something? How, why they couldn't handle it? And I mean, it was just about all I could take. And those are seemingly minor things compared to what Jesus went through. You know, I learned real quickly in those two instances how painful it can be when your sons are suffering. Even though you know it's going to pass, it's going to go, it'll, they'll, they'll get done and it'll be taken care of. And you know it's only temporary. As I went through those experiences, I realized that there was nothing, nothing that I could do to eliminate their pain. There wasn't any amount of money that I could have paid those doctors. There wasn't enough 
anesthetic to be able to fix that. I couldn't do nothing. I was helpless. I was at the mercy of those doctors that were making those decisions to do what they were doing. I, I couldn't help them. As I think about the day when Jesus was crucified and hung on that cross, hung on that whipping post, and they were cutting him open to the point of knocking out teeth and coming around his face and pulling skin loose from his ribcage and exposing his innards. As I think about those experiences that he went through where men were walking by and beating him in the face and mocking him, them driving this crown of thorns down on his head, going through this unimaginable pain, unlike me, God could have done something. God could have stopped it, but he chose not to. He stood down as his son was going through this horrific experience that he had the control to have stopped. Go to your outline. The question that begs to be asked here was not, why didn't God do something? But rather, what was restraining him to do something? What was keeping him from doing something? What was holding back the creator of the universe, this omnipotent God who, was, who had judged nations, who had established kings and empires, and had destroyed kings and empires? What kept him from lifting a finger to eliminate or alleviate some of the pain that his son was dealing with during this 12-hour ordeal? couldn't help but imagine the intensity that had to be running all throughout heaven. In my mind, I can imagine these angels, that ministering spirits that minister to God and to his saints and, and to all of heaven's duties and all, standing still. I can imagine all of heaven being silent. Nothing being said, no movement. The intensity so thick that it was unbearable. And the father watched and did nothing. What was restraining him? I'm going to ask you some questions. Have you ever been in a situation where you're falsely accused or someone had something or said something about you that wasn't true? Anybody ever lied about you? Have you ever found yourself in a situation in which there was another person that was being bullied or being taken advantage of and you couldn't do anything about it? Something horrible? You've been in a situation where someone was abusing you? There was nothing you could do about it. When these things happen, when you witness these things, how do they make you feel? You know, last Sunday as we were all returning home and we were turning the televisions on and we were turning our computers on, 
we began to learn that while we were exactly seven days ago sitting in this room completely safe, worshiping, praying, listening to God's word, there was a gunman that was running through this room in another church just south of us killing people at will. That a man that was so filled with hate that he felt the need to kill as many Christian people as he could. Women, children, people of age mattered not to him. I read one report this week that said from a survivor and she said when children were crying he would continue to shoot them until they would be silent. How'd that make you feel Sunday when you were watching the news? Diana was sitting next to me and she said I am sick. I am literally nauseous to my stomach as I watch this. Our natural and ordinary human tendency is to become angry. Were some of you angry last Sunday? Did some of you have a sense of retaliation? Were you cheerful that the gunman was dead? Did you begin to think, what if it happened here? You know... When someone comes to hurt our children, especially, that affects us differently, doesn't it? Heaven, have mercy on the individual that would want to harm our children, right? This is what makes the passion of Christ so amazing. It's what makes it so incredible. You see, the injustice of the suffering that Jesus experienced, it intensifies everything when you think about it. Because no one could help those people. No one was able to stop what was happening And yet, the very things that happened to Jesus on the day that he was crucified, God could have stopped that, and he didn't. Let's just, I just want to list the injustices that Jesus endured. Jesus was illegally arrested. They lied about him. They had false witnesses come and testify in court accusing him of things that he, he was not guilty of. They beat him in the face repeatedly to the point that you couldn't recognize who he was. They spit in his face. He was put through the most horrific type of punishment known to man at a whipping post. I don't know if you know what that looks like, but your arms are tied over your head and you're pulled tight and you're pulled up onto a post. And, and they have six men, Roman soldiers, requirement they must be at least 200 pounds. And the whip that they used had glass, had stone, had chunks of metal on it, and they were trained to pull them when it would hit pull it back and snap it so that it would cut and it would pull pieces of flesh. 
He was stripped naked only to be humiliated before all the people. They put a crown of thorns down over his head. They drove it down over his head with a reed. They mocked him. They made fun of him all throughout the 12 hours of torture. And they drove nails through his hands and his feet that held him on the cross. The only way he could breathe was he would have to push up in order to be able to get the breath out of his lungs to get another breath in, only to rest and and relax again for a moment. And yet God was restrained from doing anything to intervene. And Jesus never showed any signs of retaliation. Colossians 1, 15 through 17 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. The Bible tells us that Jesus is not only directly responsible for creation, but creation itself is held together by him. So think about this this way on your outline. The one who made all things and continued to hold all things together in regards to creation chose, chose, to receive all the injustice that his own creation could thrust upon him. His own creation, that which he had put into play, that which he was holding together, he subjected himself to its evil injustices, and his father stood by and witnessed it. What would have restrained a father from intervening on behalf of his son? Well, verse that explains this or gives us the answer is John 3.16. For God so loved the world. What restrained him? Love. His love for us is so powerful. It is so amazing that it restrained him Omnipotence held captive. Put that in your notes. Omnipotence means all-powerful. And what we witness in this story is omnipotence held captive by what? Love. His love for you and his love for me. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. As I said in our class this morning, our tendency as humans is to focus on the wrong part of that verse. When we read that verse, John 3.16, when we memorize it, when we quote it, where does our attention go to? Where does our thoughts go to? It goes to the end of the verse that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You know why? Because that's about us. That benefits us. And that's what my attention is on and this is what I desire more than anything is, is that I, what is in it for me? What do I get out of it? What It's all about me is the way we think. It's how we process all of our information. But that's not the key phrase in that verse. The 
The key is for God so loved. That's the thrust of it all. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, it said we were rebels, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Ephesians 2, 4 says, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace. 1 John 4, 10. In this love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son to be the propitiation or the satisfaction for our sins. In Revelation 1, 5, it says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. Go to your outline. The truth is that our fingerprints are all over the suffering and murdering of Jesus. But yet God's love for us restrained him from doing anything to help his own son. Would you sacrifice your child for the life of someone else? Would you? If your child was in dire need of rescue and someone else was also in dire need of rescue but you could only save one which one would you save? Which one would you risk your life to grab hold of to save? God chose us Only one could be saved, either Jesus or you and I. And his love for us compelled him to save us and let his son die. How could I personally ever love someone that was responsible for the suffering and murdering of my child? What will it take for these families in Texas to love the one to have pity upon the one took the lives of their loved ones. This kind of love can only be described one way on your outline, unconstrained. And this kind of love defies human reasoning. It makes no sense. It absolutely makes no sense. Unconstrained. No limits. For you and I to fully experience this kind of love, it must become more than a touching scene that tugs at our hearts. On your outline, there are a lot of things in life that are touching to the emotions. But for something to change or to transform my life, I must move beyond the knowing of it to the experiencing of it. And I promise you, God gives us those opportunities. What was Jesus' desire above everything else when he went to the cross? What was first and foremost on his mind when he went to the cross after praying in the garden, not my will be done, but thine be done. 
what was first and foremost on his mind? We find the answer to that question given to us just hours before he would be arrested in John chapter 17, verse 3. This is eternal life that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That is what he was praying just hours before he was arrested. You remember the words that he spoke to Pilate when Pilate said, do you not know that I have the power to release you or to crucify you? What did Jesus say? You have no power over me. You overestimate yourself, too. You have no power over me. No one, no one takes my life, but I lay it down. I give it. He had just prayed that. I give it because I desire more than anything in the world that they know you. You live your life that way? Do you spend your money that way? Do you invest your time that way? So that others will know him? How many of you use the offering plates this morning? This place doesn't run for free. It doesn't magically just, they don't give us electricity. They don't give us water, propane. They didn't give us all this furniture. They don't give us the literature that we use to teach children about Jesus Christ. How'd you spend your money today? How about your time? We need nursery workers, people that will sacrifice time four or five times a year so that others can be in here hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ spoke to them. How do you think we baptized 20-some people already this year with two or three more on the list yet to be baptized at the end of this month? It's because people invest their time. It's because people understand. They, they take on the mind and the heart of Jesus that we talked about last week. And they say, you know what? I will do this so that they might know you. What are you doing that displays the love that Christ had for you to others? That they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. How do we experience this outrageous love of God? How do we move from simply knowing about it to fully experiencing it? Number one, we got to know this. On your outline, know that you are lovable to God. Know that you're lovable. Regardless of your sin, regardless of your past, regardless of who you are, regardless of your addictions and what you're battling and what you're dealing with right now, know that you are lovable to God. 1 John 3, 1 says, see how very much, see how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children, and that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world, they don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. But they need to know him. And we are the vessel that God has chosen to use so that they can know him. You see, you and I are the all-consuming passion of our Creator. We are the very central passion of Christ. And if God's whole deal was to condemn people to hell and, and to punish wicked people, and if that was his deal, why would Jesus have spoke these words? In John chapter 3, verse 17 and 18, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. 
There's an Old Testament passage that speaks of the day of the Lord when he comes and when he'll make everything right with the world. It's in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. Look at this verse. This is such an amazing verse of Scripture. It says, the Lord your God is where? In your midst. A mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. Look at this. I love this phrase. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. Can you imagine the God of heaven singing over us? Can you imagine him delighting over us? See, there's nothing in this world that can separate us from God's love. Nothing. Romans 8, 38 and 39 says, For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation. Paul said that just in case he missed something. will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. If God can be restrained by love and do nothing while his son goes through the persecution that took place on the cross. And I am convinced that there is nothing that will ever separate us from that love. If it restrained him then, that love is open and available to us forever and ever and ever. And nothing, nothing can affect that. I want you to just think of the most unlovable person that you can think of. Don't look at your spouse. Think of the most unlovable person that you can think of. And you might think that you are more deserving of God's love than that. But do you know that Christ died for them as well? Do you know that God so loved the shooter in Texas? That God so loved a Muslim in Afghanistan? That God so loved the critic? prayer that we have seen voiced this week in the news that's right those who vehemently deny his very existence and mock us for believing in him God so loved them and died for them. If only they would believe. Romans 5.8, God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While Christ was hanging on the cross at the cruel hands of the most evil men alive, He spoke these words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Those who were mocking him, those who were spitting spitting on him, those who had beat him, those who had nailed him to that cross, those who had betrayed him and ran from him, denying that they even knew him, in his most vulnerable hour, he said they don't know what they're doing. Forgive them. Don't hold this sin to their account. Number two, after you realize what God wants for you, you can begin to realize what God wants from you. 
See, it's very unclear to a lot of people what God wants from them. You know the number one reason that people reject Christ? You know what it is? It's on the screen. It's religion. It's religion. On your outline, God does not want us to be religious. He wants a relationship with us. Religion is never going to win lost people to Christ. Religion is never going to introduce them to a loving God. Only a relationship will do that. And they need to see your relationship with Jesus first. They need to see you loving him and and experiencing his love. And as they witness that, as they watch that, if anything will compel them, it will be love. The only thing that compels someone to come to Christ and to be saved is knowing they're loved. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16 through 18, it says, What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Look at that. We are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Why? Because he loves us. Look at this, therefore come out from the midst, be separate, says the Lord, do not touch what is unclean, and I'll welcome you. I'll be a father to you, and you shall be, look at this, sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. For God so loved you. For God so loved me. It's amazing how many times God said this. I want to dwell with you. I want to be among you. I want to be in your midst. When everything else in this world fails us, God says, I'll not fail you. When no one else loves you, I will always love you. When no one else accepts you, I'll always accept you. Which leads us to number three, learn to walk in his love and acceptance. Learn to walk in his love and acceptance. How many of you have ever been involved in a relationship where you felt like you had to earn the person's love? You ever been in a situation like that? Could have been, maybe it was a parent. Maybe you grew up in a home where, where you felt like nothing you ever did was good enough for your dad or your mom. You couldn't please them no matter what you did. And that... The only way you could get their love was they, that you had to earn it. The only thing you ever heard from your parent was criticism, but never encouragement. And never I love you and care about you. Maybe it's a spouse. No matter how hard you try, they're never satisfied with you. They never approve of you. Well, guess what? It's not that way with God. You can't earn his love. There's nothing you can do to gain his love. Nothing. He loves you while you are yet sinner. While you are away from him. Colossians 1, 13 and 14 says, For he has rescued us from the domain of darkness, from that unlovable place, and he has brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You see, the Lord wants you and I to relax. He wants us to rest in knowing that he loves us. He 
He wants us to know that he accepts us. And not only does he want us to know those things, he wants us to display those things to others. You see, Romans 15, 7 says, Therefore, accept one another, just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. Just as Christ accepted you, accept one another. You see, Christ wants us to learn to love unrestrained, just as he did. Now, some of you here this morning may not be able to fathom that kind of love. You might not be able to even begin to understand an unconditional love. One that doesn't require your involvement. One that doesn't require you to earn it. But imagine being able to. Imagine being loved no matter what. Maybe you've never experienced that in your life before. I'm telling you, you can experience that from him. You see, he doesn't matter what you've done. He doesn't matter where you've come from. He doesn't matter what is holding you captive right now in regards to the sin of your life. He wants to release you of that. He wants to set you free of that bondage because he loves you. He loves you. Here's your takeaway. To really know him translates into experiencing him work in and around you in love. But you've got to put yourself in that place. You've got to come to him. You've got to surrender to him. Not commit to him. He's not interested in your performance. He's not interested in what you're capable of doing. He's not interested in what you're capable of learning. None of that impresses him at all. You have to surrender. You have to come, as the old hymn says, just as I am. Just as you are. And you surrender. And you say, whatever whatever you will. Just pour your love into me and pour it through me. Why? Because like Jesus, you want others to know him. Every one of us one day will draw our last breath in this world. Every one of us. Some of you in this room, it is highly possible and maybe even likely that one year from today, you'll not be here. You see, none of us know when that time will come when we take our last breath. There was not a single person in that church in Sutherland, Texas, last Sunday morning that expected that that day would be their last day. Not one of them. And in less than five minutes, 26 of them took their last breath. I don't say that to frighten you. I say that because the reality is this. You're going to take your last breath in this place. How are you living your life? Knowing this is true. As Peter said, 
What manner of people ought we to be? What should we be doing with our lives? How should we be spending our lives? How should we be spending our money? How should we be spending our time? How should we be thinking about what we're doing? You've got neighbors, coworkers, friends and family that are, are lost. Maybe, just maybe, you could show them the love of Jesus by how you spend your time with them, how you spend your money on them how you talk to them, how you encourage them. See, all of the resources that God has put into you, he has, he has given to you to give out to others, to use, to reach others. Randall and Jolene Elliott were an amazing testimony for Jesus Christ. Do you know why? Because they had a generous spirit. I took Jolene's grandchildren to supper the other night and I paid for their meal. And you say, well, big deal. No, there's a story, there's a reason behind that because in all of the years that I knew their grandfather, I never once was able to buy him a meal. You know why? He wouldn't allow it. He would never allow it. He would do it for anybody and everybody. He loved to share with people. He would, he, that's what was the phrase he always used. I got to share today, Ralph, with this driver that, I, that went to Oklahoma with me to pick up a truck. Or I got to share with this couple. Or I got to share with them. And I said, you bought them lunch or dinner, didn't you? And he said, yes, I did. I knew it. There could be 12 people sitting at the table, and guess what? He would pay for it. It was a reflection of his generosity, not about the money. It had nothing to do with about the money. It had to do with the opportunity to share because he could love them that way. He could bless them, and by blessing them, that would open the door to, to, to sharing with them. It was about one thing to him and to her that they might know him. Do you live your life that way? Do you spend your time? Do you volunteer? Do you engage? Do you sacrifice a Saturday to go work with a neighbor to help somebody out that you know doesn't know Jesus, but you go and you give to them and you work with them and you help them, you assist them? Just because you want them to know Jesus? To really know him translates into experiencing him working in and around you in love. Now does the takeaway make sense? Now does it, take, does it make sense? I hope it does. God was restrained by love. And he was compelled by love. Let's pray. Father, this morning I hope we get it. I hope that there is not a cynical spirit in this room. I hope that there is only a receiving spirit and every person that is in this place. If there's someone here this morning that they have never, never confessed you as Savior and trusted you for salvation, I pray today is that day. I pray today is the day that they would come to know you.
I pray, Father, that for those of us that do know you, we would understand the importance and the value of being used by you. And that we would use every resource that we have to show love to others that they might know you. We'll probably never have to give our life for someone else. Not in death anyway. But we can give our life for others by letting you use us in all that you have given us. I pray this in your name, Jesus, that they might know you. Amen. I'm going to ask you to keep your head bowed for just a moment. That connection card that's in that seat pocket in front of you is there for a reason. If you don't know Jesus, I would ask you to take that card with you, tear the top off of it. If nothing else, it's perforated. Connect with me. Put your name, your number on that card, or tear the top off and call me. Give me the opportunity to minister to you and to tell you about Jesus, to share with you what the Bible says. If you already know Jesus, but there's someone in your life that the Lord is speaking to you about right now that is convicting you of, maybe that's an unlovable person. We've been talking about that for a couple weeks now. Ask him to give you a love for them that you've not known yet a love that allows you to share with them. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for all that you do. Use us as you, sh- as you see fit, however you choose. And Father, when there is nothing left to use of us, then take that breath out of our body and let us come home to be with you. I pray this in your name. Amen. I love you guys. Have a great day.